So if your question is like what what's deployed where that today's primarily handled through uh, a BMC tool called Blade Logic and that will show you what version is deployed to, to which environments. And the, the assets in Artifactory, so that you can put the binaries and stuff in there. Uh, where's, where's my... Most of this is handled by directly by our DevOps team, so the, it's actually very, very small. The teams are best suited to know what's going where, when. Um, so we've handed a lot of that over to them directly. And they handle like the, the CRQs, the change records, and all those sorts of things to specify all that. So we have a, one of Erica's team is called the ESN team. So they actually run the pipeline to build the CI pipeline. But then the teams do all the work off of that CI pipeline. Uh, so yeah, we, we, we definitely get audited obviously every year by Ernst & Young um, and we have a lot of different traceability. They typically, when they come in to do the audits, they ask for a lot of tons of ad hoc queries. So you have to kind of have that data ready to go and available to you. Um, you know, we like ZDM because it's simple. It's a very simple solution. A lot of the ones that are out there like Urban Code and uh, Electric Cloud, they're very powerful, extremely powerful tools. Um, and we, but, but at the end of the day, we just wanted something that was very model driven so that we could control it from the centralized release team um, and not let things go wild, wild west. We used HP PPM uh, release before this, and there was a million spaghetti diagrams out there that people had no idea what the heck they actually did. And we did not want that uh, uh, moving forward. That helps. Thank you. Who else has got a question? So, some of the hands up. Sorry, can you start, say your, your name and the question and where you're from as well? So that's from Kaisers, uh, and the question is, what would you do if you can roll back two years and do it again, or differently? Uh, yeah, so I, I think one thing I touched upon it in our talk this morning uh, was we, di we didn't have enough of a focus on culture early enough in our process. And, you know, we really took the approach of these methods speak for themselves, and for many people they really do. But to get everyone on the organization on board with what's going on, I think we just should have had that, that targeted culture focus earlier in the process for us. And we often get so busy in the day-to-day -day execution and making sure we're delivering new features and that our operations environment is up and things are functioning, that it's very easy to forget that part without that targeted focus on it. And I was going to add to I think, um, you know, when we gave our speech, we talked about D17 and First Niagara. We were replatforming our application, rewriting the entire application, and then we had to accelerate all of that. So if I could go back a year and a half and bring in more people to help us, I would have loved to have been able to kind of embrace the microservices approach a little bit more in our new application. So that's a journey we're going to be going on now, but the application is already, already running, it's already in production. So the way we roadmap that out, you know, we're going to have to be there's going to be considerations that we'll have to work through now that we wouldn't have done, had to work through maybe if we had done it from the get-go. Um, and then you, you can see now, I was just going to say I, I would have hired uh, way sooner. Uh, not all resources are going to be transferable to the new skill sets, and we should have hired two years ago. We should have hired three years ago. X amount of years before I started there. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I, I do want to say to you that the hardest thing because you have great developers on your team that have been with the bank or been with you know your organizations for years. So there's a lot of like tribal built up knowledge, and as you start to get at least on the delivery side, especially maybe on infrastructure too, as you start to get into these newer tool sets, it is a completely different way of thinking, and you can't always retrain that, you know, it takes a different mindset. So we've been lucky just, I mean, even with First Niagara, got some great engineers, you know, on our team from, and it just made, like, the light bulb went off. It's like, oh, wow, yeah, this is really where we need to go and what we need to be asking ourselves. So I think realizing that early on to help you, you know, further your journey even more, you know, is definitely the way to go. And I would just add that um, our story is a grassroots story. So we're creating a fair bit of waves within the organization. So equipping the engineers in my team with more of the softer skills, uh, you know, more orientation around empathy and giving them a vocabulary to work with other folks. Because uh, as I mentioned in my talk, 
um, going from that, we're going to buy everything. There's a lot more things we're going to disagree about. And if we don't have a constructive way to work through those, it's just going to cause a lot of friction and uh, tension that doesn't need to be there. Some, some creative tension is fine, but, um, you know, just kind of keeping an eye on one another and being good to each other. Great. We've got a couple more questions. First, Stephen from I Connect. What does start with culture mean? Yeah, so we're still figuring that out, I would say. <laughs> um, so, we asked you, we asked you guys yeah. help us. So. so we actually were spitballing some ideas on, on the plane of some different things that we want to do as far as next steps. You know, one idea, if you're familiar with the Atlassian model, um, they have a monthly topic that each manager discusses with their direct report. So they've replaced their performance reviews with these discussions each month where they're having a topic each month and it's something in the in the leadership space. So it's not even always just just DevOps, although DevOps is important, but just taking a step back and focusing on on the people part. So that was that was one idea. Um, Scott, I haven't chatted with you about this yet, but you know another idea was having targeted time uh, at, at staff meetings. We were actually talking about that concept each week and maybe somebody's responsible for that. And you reserve time at that meeting because again, it's very easy to get uh, to spend a half hour or an hour, however long those meetings are, and talk about execution and operations and how are things going and to neglect that leadership and that culture side of things. So those are a, a few you know, kind of spitballing ideas, but I'd love to hear others if you guys have things that you're doing that work well. Yes, yeah, so um, I think the question is, can I elaborate on what we did with the performance review reviews to make it safe for cultural um, growth, right? Uh, so I will mention that uh, we didn't go right at culture directly. We tried to bring some new practices that revealed new cultural components indirectly. I'm a big believer that um, I have a young child. No amount of me telling him his uh, the stove is hot is equal to him putting a hand on the stove and saying, wow, it's hot. So. Okay. Yeah. Hopefully, there's um, no child services. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And I'm not calling our team children at, at work either. But I'm just saying that uh, letting them uh, feel it for themselves and having small vignettes that are in a safe place for them to experience those cultural changes has been important to us. And just to kind of elaborate on the year end review process, we had all this stuff, all these competencies, and it was just it was mind numbing. And it was awesome because we the product that we used. You could do the writing assistant, and you could actually uh, pre-populate what your response was in terms of your competency. And so it was just a zombie exercise where the engineers would just click, 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 and not put any self-reflection into it. So we stripped them of that, and we said, we want you to do some self-reflection. We want you to kind of think about uh, what your own learning progress has been. We want you to be accountable to uh, yourself and to your team in terms of that, that learning. And so we really structured the, the questionnaire to, to reinforce that. I don't know if I answered your question, but. No, I cheated on it. Yeah. And, and we knew that uh, people were going to be failing, failing, so we you know went at that head on and said, hey, tell us about your failures. Um, and if you don't have any, maybe you're not pushing hard enough. And if you do, let's celebrate those. Let's learn from them. Let's move on. That's actually a great illustration of, of what, what Cotter talks about that in leading change, right? That you, you can't change culture directly. It doesn't work that way. What you, in fact, he says culture often comes last. But what he says to get there is you start changing habits. And that's what you guys are really talking about. We start changing the language. We start changing what we do and how we do it. And, and over time, that difference will will arc the culture in a different direction, but it, it's a lagging indicator, it's not a leading thing. Sorry, Barbara, did you just have a question? Yes. Barbara from? Um, so my question centers around um, the power of
I just want to ask, did you ask for that job? No, I did not. <laughs> I, I was asked if I would like to take this job. That, that might be the first problem. Yeah, that's 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 the first problem. So can you start with one team? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And show like one success. So yeah. First. That, and that, yes, and that's exactly how we're trying to structure it. Um, to take pockets. So our, um, you know, we've broken down uh, within the, the DevOps team, if you will, or the core team that we've now put together. Um, we've broken it down into, you know, direct on the business, deliver cost to remote, client, and profitability in the organization, and we're starting to build. So our team that supports our robot application is the first team in the to be deployed, right? And then we're going to start to deploy and roll out um, from there. That's, that's the approach we'd like to take. There's I, I was going to um, interject real quick. I know that this is not the chef conference, but there was a talk from about 2014, 2015, and Nordstrom was talking about how they were leading change. And there was a great talk about bootstrapping that that we borrowed heavily upon uh, in terms of formulating our own journey. And Courtney Kissler back there in the back should be, I'm sure, uh, very happy to talk to you about the early stage uh, formation because I think as Scott mentioned, start with one team. Uh, maybe those folks can actually go train the trainers who after they're uh, exhibiting the patterns and behaviors you want, you can start to then sprinkle them out and help other teams and... Exactly, so if you show success with them and build advocates to do it in other places, it would be a lot easier. And, and I just want to add, I, mean, I think you have to have the right team. You know, so I, I wouldn't just kind of pick whoever's available, you know, and hey, let's put them on this project. I would definitely make sure that you get the right thought leaders if this is something that's going to start small and then kind of grow because there's just there's so much opportunity that if we didn't have the right people at the table to call it out there would have been things we would have missed you know because so i think it's just being able to put the right team together to you know start your journey is also really important great thanks we had a question over here from brian from walmart So that was a question to anyone. Have you found a way to retrain management to avoid them going backwards, back to the old habits? <laughs> so we, we kind of faced that at, at SRA. You saw from the numbers. We trained, you know, uh, it was the top, you know, quarter of the company in, in changing their, their leadership mindsets and behaviors. Yeah. So, but, but as you saw, we worked at we worked at every level, and including. And one of the things that we did is so that there's several several things. One, we, we brought that uh, that middle management into our our leadership activity. So we would have these you know, strategic <coughs> offsites and and so forth. And we were in the middle of this program, and we said, we've got to we've got to demonstrate that how important these folks are because they lead the people who really do the work. And so there's a, there's a, you know, there's a practical and also a messaging thing there. So our, our meeting exploded in size, but wow, we talk about getting you know, a, a lot of really positiveness from that. The other thing we did is just this, this culture of mutual accountability, right? So it's one of the reasons why we found people in the cohorts, we did check-ins, we did, it wasn't just like go to a day of training and then off you go and there's no support system. Uh, we, the mentoring, the, the, the coaching, the follow-ups, the, you know, the, the whole package was, a, and, and, and the people doing the coaching and, and the mentoring were you know, very trained individuals, good, really good coaches. So they, you know, they were looking for the right things, they were hearing the right things and you know, providing that, that guidance. But what I love is seeing the mutual uh, we'd be in a meeting that completely uh, unrelated to that, and you know, I'd hear the conversations afterwards where you know people were calling each other, 
No, no, look, we're not, we're not going to lead that way anymore, right? And that, that's when you knew it was catching, right? It was, it was becoming intrinsic in the, in the thought process, in the mindset, and the behaviors. But that's not one meeting. It's not. I mean, that's a, that was a journey, right? Of constant reinforcement, like, like Dave Marquet says, right? In this video, you know, you're going to go down this journey. You're going to fall back. You know, you're going to get angry at yourself, and then you're going to keep yourself back up. And you're going to try it again. Right? And you just gotta do that because it's it's not easy. I mean, this is a hard process for us to change. We keep going. Just keep going. Communicate with people. I might have to tell the same person the same thing. I mean, I, I really did. I would hear myself telling the same person the same thing several times, and then finally, you know, a light bulb goes off. But yeah, definitely over communicate. <laughs> and I think you know the approach of go see. It is really important here. I think the a team stand up is probably the the best meeting if you want to spend 15 minutes and be down in the weeds once in a while. Obviously, we don't have time to attend all of our team stand ups all the time, but I, I think it's important, really, even at the higher levels, to once in a while to go to those meetings. You see, how is the team interacting? What are they working on? How much width do we have? Like, what you know. Those sorts of things, that plan, do, check, act cycle, right? So we've told them to do a number of things. I've told them to do peer reviews. Are we talking about the peer reviews? Can I look at the, the work that's going on? And just spot checking those things. And then following up, when you have your one-on-ones with that manager, hey, I saw you know these, these three things at stand up that were a bit odd to me. Could, let's talk through you know why, why did this look that way? Um, I found that to be a pretty effective mechanism. Oh, I have one more thing. So over communicate and repeat and I'm not great at this and I'm working on it but the tenth time that you tell someone needs to be just like the first time <laughs> because if we if we're super frustrated if we're sarcastic or disingenuous that's going to undercut what we're trying to say right um, and it's definitely something I'm working on and uh, the other thing I'll say is amnesty so yes you told the person a year ago about the thing and they weren't ready but if they're ready now, let the past be the past. Don't hold it over their head and say, well, you weren't ready to work when I was ready to work, so fully on you. Like, if they're showing up, you're like, okay, I'll take you in any form and I'll start to work with you. So, amnesty and patience, I guess. So, there's a question with the back there. Sorry. Okay. You, it's you, yeah. Uh, I'm Dave, I'm from Adobe, and uh, I think this is a question for Keith. So, you showed up the charts on. So you're asking about the, the, the metrics. <laughs> yeah, and then there's one other point, which is that the, the, the biggest drop for the number of incidents was in January 2018. But there was no explanation of whether that was a projection or a downstream plot, which I yeah. see very Yeah, so, uh, so there are a couple things. One, one, one demonstrating API growth and subscriber growth, right? So the, the green metrics, the good metrics are going up, right? You're making more money. Uh, TPS on the platform consumption is going up. The other metrics are around quality. So the incident metrics were basically showing the monthly intake of incidents basically on the on the platform. And just last month we we dropped to around 630 incidents per month. And I just extrapolated, assuming at least we'll do that well towards the end. I just looked actually before this, and we hit last month 512. So we dropped another 100 incidents per month. So we continue to go down. Um, that, that monthly run rate is attributable to a combination of one, having to build run teams, then they basically own the service quality of what they build, but also really having to focus on a kind of quality investment and looking, going and finding these root cause issues that have been around for a while. And those root cause issues were probably originally fixed by either level one or level two and fixes and air quotes because 
they just put a Band-Aid on it, right? And then the issue comes back again because it might be a data cleanup, like the root cause was never really fixed the why it was there. Does that kind of make sense and uh, explain uh, what that, that graph was saying? Okay. Okay, thanks. One more. So, what's your name again? Steve Thomas. So, if you have to make a driving Okay, so uh, what's the first metric when you're starting a transformation? Um, <laughs> we were starting at a fundamentally different place, and a lot of times you'll hear a DevOps story that really starts dev into ops, and ours was really infrastructure engineering out. And as I uh, kind of uh, recall, we focused on one thing, and that was version control, because everything else needed to kind of flow from that. And if we couldn't even version our, our infrastructure, um, that would be a problem. And while we're in the process of version and infrastructure, we were teaching a whole bunch of other things. So it was that gateway drug to create opportunity for other conversations. Uh, so we kind of overloaded that metric over time, but it's still year one version control for us. So I, I guess I'd, I'd follow the question up. It's like, what are, what are you trying to accomplish? Because I, I think for us, some things that look at that, that we looked at metrics really important lead time like how long does like anything take to get right is it a server that takes eight weeks and why right um, or the other one to look at you know I always tell people focus on lead time and that's lead time around everything and the other is time to recovery uh, so if, if incidents are your problem looking at your time to recovery is something that's extremely important because it, it, it surfaces a whole bunch of other things. One, visibility of what's going on in the system. Uh, it forces people to learn uh, to, to deal with it correctly. It forces good architectures because, uh, you know, if, if you're recovering quickly from a failure, like you're always going to fail, right? So you can't prevent all failure. And I think Sidney Decker has a, a talk about that. But how do we recover from failure as fast as possible? And then that means you're creating really good architectures. So. Again, for us, it was some of those things around lead time and then recovery time. Like, how do we recover faster and how do we learn from that recovery and then make the system better afterwards and continue to do that over and over again? Because that enforces all kinds of great things in the environment and in the people. Okay, we have a question over there. Yep. So I think there are probably a, a couple of different questions there. So, um, you know, the question about how do you make sure that somebody doesn't go off and do their own their own load balancing solution? We do have an enterprise architecture review board that uh, you basically have to go, you know, justify why you want to do that. So there are things where you do want to standardize. I'm sorry. Is it? Oh, cat, no. Uh, it, 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 it's it's it does. It, it, <laughs> well, we're still yeah. looking at transforming that, and you're right. I mean, the, the, those can get dangerous very quickly, right? Um, but I, I would say that for the most part, we we don't have truly autonomous teams. They are dependent on a number of shared infrastructure services. When you with the concept of, of a service owner, um, that that service owner for the most part, most of our service owners own products that are customer facing products, um, and then you also have some some infrastructure resource. So I've got some of both. I've got the load balancer. I've got some customer facing products. But it often, if it ends up where you've got an issue with say the load balancer is affecting another product and those two service owners partner together 
Um, you, um, those t Scott talked about swarming. I like both of those service centers are on an outage call if it's a major outage. After the fact, both of them are coordinating together with their teams to hold the post incident review to put the AAS together. Um, so there, there's still some, some crossover between that, but it's still those people, the idea is that they're looking across and we're, we're meeting each other where we used to have silos where it was handoffs between where now it's a partnership together. Does that answer your question? So, so I think, I think there's a couple other things. So, so one shared services is, is, is difficult to do when you start thinking about, um, you know, kind of the traditional handoff mechanisms and, and ticket management that's done in it because you basically just end up with all these queues and, and people can't see really kind of the end to end. So one of the things that, that we're doing, what Eric has done with, um, with a lot of the tools is really self-service automation. That basically now really kind of opens up the, the standards and makes it easy for people to use. Similar like with our chef infrastructure, we, we basically make that available for all the teams to consume, train them, enable them. We don't want requests coming to those central teams to do um, what I would call traditional IT tasks. Uh, we want those edge teams to do it, and if you make it easy for those teams to consume the standards, then um, they're much more likely to, and it becomes an evangeliz evangelization problem and really an ease of service problem. Uh, if I have to wait six weeks to get you know, a new endpoint for a load balancer, well, I've got to spin my own up because I don't want to wait for six weeks. But if it takes you know two minutes to click on a button to create myself a new endpoint, that's kind of very different. So. I, it, it is a, it is always a challenge because you know and I think uh, um, this is a discussion of the last talk like how do you provide governance right because you are required to do lots of stuff from auto security but then how do you allow the teams the freedom to innovate and balancing between those things is, is a constant challenge. One other thing too because I think for some of the shared services at key like they're shared services. So they don't have to report in a hierarchy, but we have dedicated people in those teams that align just to the work that we're doing in digital. So they've got their own kind of best practices and governance, you know, that there's experts in their particular field, but at the same time, they're part of our team, they're in my staff meetings, they're just like anyone else that would be non-shared. You know what I mean? So I, I think that you can sometimes find a nice balance with that approach too. Thanks, so we had a question just there. No, it's Taylor from Edward Jones. Okay. Um, I'm curious to hear from you guys, kind of related to the question that we have here, how you got to that next kind of evolution of your organization at the team level. You heard about you know, pods, squad, how you're kind of managing cross functional teams, cross skill set teams, which is obviously we have to do The, the short answer is um, what is is what we were doing wasn't working, <laughs> and um, we we had some leadership changes occur, and at that point we decided to just blow it all up and basically move all the operations resources that were you know in different groups doing different stuff, and we said, well, why don't we just put those on the teams that the folks that are building the software. So um, that that happened in March of 16, you know, and, and uh, what we were doing previously was it wasn't getting better. It was people were miserable. The performance of the system wasn't where we wanted it, we wanted it to be. Um, so this was a big step for us to basically um, do that. The short answer. <laughs> and I think you had a model to already kind of follow with Agile, right? Because once upon a time you had dev teams and QA teams, and maybe an analyst that was somewhere else. And we had seen how successful it was with, with Agile to bring all those people together. So to us, it was just kind of a natural extension of that concept that we were already operating with. Now, if you, you're you not running Agile teams, then it's a, a much larger leap to go straight to that endpoint. 
And I'll just add, I think, so I actually have a team that we just moved to Agile earlier in the year, and it was kind of just like, we're doing it. You know, it was in the middle of a project, we didn't start nice and clean, but in this particular situation, I think is what we needed to do to get the, so there was gaps in, okay, what was being tested, was it what we thought we were designing, you know, there's just gaps all along the entire pipeline. So we just said, you know what, we're moving to Agile, we got the business together, we got, so it wasn't like we were doing something to somebody else, but it was kind of like we were collaborating and how do we solve the problem. Um, and it, it really helped, I think, this team specifically, like we were starting and stopping so much, you know, because there were so many unanswered questions and not everything was designed fully before the developers got a hold of it. So in some cases, you just have to say, you know what, we're just gonna do it and get everyone together in a room and, and just do it. And it's never perfect, it's never easy. I mean, we have gone through so many different variations of where we started to where we are today with that team. And I don't think any two teams are alike either. I mean, they all have their own kind of model. It's all within an overall framework, but some have backlog grooming meetings, you know, these durations. Others do it a little bit differently. They're still having the conversations and the collaboration, but I don't think you have to worry about carbon copy, you know, either. You can kind of pick a team, do it, and then another team could be doing it, but differently. At the end of the day, it takes, you know, the one kind of thing. So you can't force cultural change, right? So you could see your, your point, but doing the work differently and then starts to you know change people's you know uh, perception of what's accomplishable and so but the thing that does require regardless is, is leadership courage so if, if you don't have leaders at these different levels that are willing to actually take a risk and change um, it's really really hard and I think that 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 to me is some of the number one thing that a lot of these organizations struggle with is the, the changes that need to be made at the leadership level um, are hard um, because they risk people's jobs. It's like they might not be the right people to do it. And those things are extremely difficult for folks to make those decisions. And if they can't make those decisions, it's so hard to show how the teams are gonna work differently to then get them performing better. Uh, so it's extremely hard, just to, just to be clear. And it's extremely hard in really traditional IT shops. We, we kind of have the benefit that we were a product development shop that also had IT that we uh, ran it. But we kind of have a bit of the DNA of building our own products and not being necessarily harnessed to kind of the, the way traditional IT thought processes were. Where IT's off in the corner and some of the business requirements and they'll come back later. Um, and, and so it's going to be even harder for a lot of um, the more traditional IT companies to bridge that divide. I think the technology is forcing the conversation more and more, right? Everything's becoming more software defined. You have to be more cross-functional in nature in order just to support the new stuff that's coming out. So it's just gonna be an evolution. And I echo the comments completely about the leadership side of it. Not It's not gonna fit everybody's job description and job role. Some people are gonna wanna stay Cisco certified experts in specific engineering technologies. And guess what? That's just not gonna fit the new world of the world enterprises have to be. Yeah, I'll just mention that uh, I think Scott was kind of implying it was kind of a benevolent uh, dictatorship, like, hey, this is the way it's going to be. And that's exactly what happened. I had all the disciplines in infrastructure engineering minus networking. And we just said, this is what's going to happen. We're going to commingle uh, storage and systems and databases and all the other stuff. And we're going to build these cross functional teams. And uh, actually, one of um, uh, a couple of the folks on the team suggested, they're like, hey, can we try this? I'm like, let's do it. So it wasn't very clean, and we got it wrong the first, uh, some personalities didn't quite click, so the next time we're on our fifth cycle, we mixed it up a little bit, so. And, and the example I gave my, in, in the, the speech this morning, my friend Steve in operations, he was like, well, this is ridiculous, why don't we have these people sit here? <laughs> like, you know, I just, you know, you know, it seems simple at the time, but you're like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Like, why don't they have one stand up? Like, like why, why are they having separate, meetings to talk about what we're developing and then what, what we're operating on, right? And so some of those some of those things now looking back at those are some things I wish we'd have done earlier. But um, you know it took leadership courage to do those things to be like, hey well, why don't people why don't we try working differently? Let's try one see right? And then see see how see how it works. Okay, we've got a couple more questions. One from here. Uh, it's 
so the answer is we run everything. <laughs> it, it, it's not fun. I uh, wish we did. Um, that being said, we do have you know some kind of common standards which we are kind of the bedrock that we point people to. You know, two two operating systems, RHEL and, and uh, Windows, and then um, you know some minimal viable standards around like Chef automation and, and uh, deployment. Uh, some standard databases, like Oracle, SQL Server, and Postgres, are really kind of those those standards. Kind of outside of those, and teams have a bit of freedom to do what do what they want. Um, also, we're we're trying to move more now to kind of outcome based. So, for example, like there's certain outcomes that are, are technologies that are non-negotiable. Like you have to use our ADFS and some of our security tools. Like those aren't negotiable. But there's other stuff like um, you know uh, like NoSQL databases where it's like, hey, we, we kind of have two teams using Cassandra, but like, if you want to use or that or Elastic, you could pick something else up. But we're not really rigid about those types of standards. They, they can, you know, merge off and innovate in those other areas. And if you pick it, you got to run it. You got to pick it. You got to run it, right? And you got to pay for it. And, and some of the having the combined operations and um, development, right? And they look at the whole cost. They got to be like, all right, well, I need to go to the product manager and ask for. Five hundred thousand dollars for you know this new software package or something. Well, they're looking at all that stuff now and being like, well, if we really want to do that. Why don't we use this open source or this other database that's cheaper or one that we already have because it's going to take us six weeks to build out a DJ MySQL environment or something like that. And just don't have expertise in what to do and how to say, but we already have DJ across all those others. So the outcome is the same. We still provide high quality DCG. So if you want to go do that yourself, you can. But it's going to take you six to eight weeks in front of you. Uh, it's not any value for the business. So, so Gene always throws this question out actually around standardization and, and how do you account for it with DevOps? And uh, it's 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 gray. It's gray. It's not a black and white answer uh, by any means. I will say though, because we actually went through something like this when we migrated Hello Wallet over. So they were the startup, thirty-two employee firm that. Had all these different tools, um, running MongoDB, you know, MySQL, and at Key, we, um, you know, we have database teams that have really deep expertise, right, in the database platforms that our enterprise architecture team has said this is key standard. So, right now we're running just because we're running on Mongo because we needed to get them over quickly. We had to be off of out of Capgemini by a certain period, but the intention is we're going to be moving them into our standard databases. And I can tell you though, this team and they're mostly engineers are very excited about it because you know they don't want to necessarily have to worry about databases and some of their jobs and queries aren't performing like they know they should be. You know they just don't have that full breadth of expertise in everything. I mean, they're generalists, which is great, but then there's also some areas where in some ways it, it, it is helpful to have these deep experts that can tell you exactly how to change your query to make your app run you know, a lot more um, effectively. So it's just, there's a, I think it's both ends of the coin. You know, in some areas I think it's great, in other areas there's benefit having a single you know, solution that you've got deep expertise in. So I, I was thinking of kind of, this is, I mean, this topic, this area is just crazy debate right now of like innovate standard, innovate standard. But I kind of think, look at other industries, right? Like, like, let's look at like the airlines and like look at Southwest, right? They fly the same damn plane. And the reason they do that is you can train people, make it predictable, you can repair it, you know, you can patch it, like all those things. If you run 55 different OS variants, and I know people that do that, then how do I maintain those and how do I make sure they're secure and when there's an exploit, my exploit surface area is massive now, right? I have to have all that other stuff and all, all the exploits. So there are really good reasons to have some solid standards um, that, that are consumed, let alone, you know, how do you train people, right? If I've got, you know, all these different OS variants or I've got all these different programming languages, like at some point, like you need to hire and you need to, train, you need to provide enterprise um, you know, really stability for those types of things. So I do think it's in, uh, it is important. I think a little bit goes back to what I talked about in the, the, the kind of ER reference previously, is can you make those standards really easy for people to consume and use? And do they let, you know, and can I push a button and then I, can I get a VM or can I push a button and get a database environment? Like, you know, like the public cloud. And if you can, then it makes it really easy for people to consume those because you're bringing them value quickly Especially if HA is dealt with and backed up, and I mean, DevOps, 
a developer's a developer, so they don't worry about this stuff. Like my, my database is backed up, and as long as it's resilient, I'm good to go. But then if I've got to go do that, it's like, oh, man, that's just. Could it be that they may have to buy all your startups for Definitely, guaranteed. So. All the current standards will be legacy. Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, we've got a couple more questions, I think. We've got one over here. We've got a quick one from Tobin. So I think the operational cost, what happened when you moved to the DevOps environment? Did it go up or down? And what did you do with the people to keep that cost? So when you say that, I don't think that that's, I wouldn't consider that's the definition of DevOps, is that operations or developers can do operational work. That's not the definition. No. Well, I'm not always sure what the definition of DevOps is. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that's not the intent. Don't you still divide the cost into operational costs? Why do you care? So, so I, I, I understood, but I had this discussion with my product management. Is and so I showed the backlog with all the stuff on it that needs to be done, right? So that cost, and, and you have an operations cost and you have a development cost, well, the cost is the same. Let's say it's 50 50. Right? So you spend $10 million on that product, right? The, the real thing is, is how much business value can I deliver? Am I getting a million dollars of business value? Am I getting zero? Or am I getting nine and a half million out of that 10 million investment, right? And if I then improve the service operations, I can drive the cost. But I, I think the, 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 the question for me that I look at now is really, you don't want to spend a lot on service operations, but the only way to drive that cost down is to then invest in it up front so that you make the services you use. And, and the question you ask is, did it go up or down? Right now, it's the same. <laughs> The cost is really the same. Uh, if there's a lot of different variables that go along with this, right? Um, you know, I think if we look at total cost of ownership to run and manage applications, um, for us, it's night and day different from what we're doing. Uh, we we embrace open source uh, wholeheartedly, and that itself is a cost savings opportunity for most enterprises that really start looking in that direction. Um, our team sizes are smaller for for applications that maybe like run on our Kubernetes platform versus other platforms, but. Um, because you know most of it's all automated and scripted. You don't need a, an army to upkeep it. So I think that there's cost savings there. I, I would say we've, we've never done the full analysis. I mean, some of the licensing stuff we have, and that's been substantial. Um, but overall, I, I think there's a benefit there. But it, it ultimately, going back to what Scott said, it's, it's about what you want to do with that number. I was just going to say, so our, our presentation last year was called uh, When Ops Swallows Dev. And I think it's, uh, if you bring two organizations together and you've got a lot of tech debt in the operations space, it's very easy to see that happen. And, and I think we saw that happen at the beginning of ours. And I had developers in my office saying, oh my God, like what did you do? But over time you apply the development concepts to those operational problems and they become development problems too. And no longer are they ops problems versus development. Now I've got infrastructure as code. So while I'm running infrastructure, I've got people who are you know, checking out the source code. I've got automated tests around it. I've got CA, all, CI, all those same sort of concepts. And it becomes kind of blurred. So I'll, I'll back up the, the, the comments about you know, the cost being kind of merged together. But just kind of the evolution of what your work looks like over time does change. OK, last couple of questions are Thomas yes. from Right, and uh, tell me how, how would you guys uh, deal with this? Some audit, probably run some audit 
workers that have been aware of DevOps and how we put them in all the you know, continuous uh, deployment uh, pipeline? Yeah, so um, we the one thing I the one thing I, our CIO is actually extremely passionate about is being upfront and forward with our auditors with the OCC. So we have uh, monthly and quarterly sessions that we do with the OCC to tell them about ideas that we're working on. And before we implemented anything, we had a conversation with them about it. They didn't understand what we were talking about. There's no doubt, right? Um, so I'm sure they had to go back and Google a lot of the things that we said we were going to do. Um, I think that can work in your benefit and, or it can also hurt you. In our, in our instance, it helped us because um, they went and did some, some homework on it. And I think, you know, we're not, we're making things actually much safer. We're not making anything worse. The separation of duties is still there. In fact, it's, it's actually even better because, um, and Topol Pal, uh, he did a talk, I believe, at DevOps Days, a talk about the concept of the clean room, but really it's completely hands off. There is no duty because it is 100% automated for what gets put into production. And, 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 and so you, no one really has access at that point in time. So, you know, I think it gets, for some reason, you know, it, since it's so much change, you, you think it's scary from an auditing perspective, but you have to like look at every single thing that you're talking about and saying, we're actually gonna make it better. It's gonna be more transparent, it's gonna be more traceable, and it's gonna be less human interaction. You know, if you ran through a situation with auditors who are different, you have to say, okay, hope you make your life online here, and, uh, you know, and then you have to come back. So that's the point about being proactive with yeah. your auditors. Yeah, yeah. 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 So the auditor approach, we involved them. The same discussions came up right when we merged with teams. They're like, oh no, like now I've got operations people sitting next to the development people, and you know, and like it's much better, right? They can you know, plan this stuff out, they can automate. Um, but a lot of it was working with the auditors up front to get them to understand. Um, but then you get the rest of the great benefits of infrastructure as code. So we use like Inspect for um, compliance and. And we had to explain that to the auditors, and once they get it, they're like, oh, I see that you're actually validating your compliance with it. And we actually produced like a Word document for them to inspect so that it's easier for them to read. But um, someday, my hope is that you've got auditors that, that can read that, and they, they'll, they'll read it themselves, right? That's something that I'd actually like to work on and say, can we get an auditor trained in, you know, in, in, in code so that they can read it so that we don't have to translate it into the documents for them. So, um, yeah, it's all, a lot of that's really collaboration, but you, you get all the right controls with, you know, tools like Rumdeck, Chef, that can then, you know, really control access to those environments you don't have to keep getting into it. Yeah, I was going to mention it. Topo Pal from Capital One and Bill Shen uh, from AWS are doing some really uh, good work, and you can take a look at um, some of their thoughts. And there's probably some things that are even auditor ready. You could actually watch a talk with one of your auditors and actually help them to understand what you're trying to achieve. So, yeah. well, putting on my other hat uh, from from the same perspective, so I, I came to the company after 15 years working with the federal government, so I sort of lived that world, uh, and actually wrote our compliance guidance on uh, on the framework. And what what we found at doing transformations in the government space is, uh, we, so we in in that article we talk about things like. You know, we, we've been talking about building quality in for years and years. Uh, why can't we build compliance in? Right? So we actually build the, you know, look at the, the elements that drive the compliance. And we we make it visible. And we, we build it into, into coding standards, definition of done, all these different things. The other thing we do is we, we invite them into the process sooner rather than later. Because what any... You know, any auditor, any, any person worth their, worth their salt will tell you is they actually have a better result doing their job if they're looking at it in smaller pieces. Now, that's not an easy step because they've got entire work models and, you know, staffing levels that are built the old way. But, but if, you, if you get them kind of one-on-one -on -one and ask them, is it easier to ensure quality and, and, and verify a small thing or a ginormous thing? What they'll, if, if they're honest, what they'll say is, well, you know, we're, we're relying on a statistical sample uh, if we do the big thing. If I see the small thing, I can actually look at it and you know, understand it. And then the last thing is, how valuable is it to have that feedback early on? Like, we invite them in and say, look, if you see something and you tell us now, we can go fix it when the cost of change is small. And 
because we, you know, we're continuously learning. We can, we can do all those good things of, okay, how do we bake that in so we don't have that problem again in the future? And so the quality over time just gets better and better and better. And I, we, we do work with medical equipment, uh, comes from the largest in the world. And we, we see they have FDA people in their back pocket every single day. So we understand the problem. And this is how they work. This is how they do it. Great, thanks. We're out of time there, I'm afraid. So it just leads us to thank our panel. Give me a round of applause.